Good morning, Bethesda Baptist Church. So glad to have you guys with us this morning. We're so glad that you are all here. Well, we thank you for those of you who are watching at home. We've had some internet issues this morning. So if you're watching at home, you're not watching live, you're watching the recorded service um, because, well, the internet decided not to work. Um, so as we get into this this morning, we're so glad that everybody's here. Tonight, big announcement, tonight at 6.30, we are going to have, uh, tonight at 6.30, we're having our business meeting. Uh, the business meeting is going to work similar to the worship services. We're going to encourage you guys to come in and sit like you normally would for a worship service. And we're going to talk through several different things. We're going to give some updates on things that we're working on so that everybody's kind of clued in on what's going on. Um, and then... As we have the business meeting, if you cannot make it for the business meeting or you're watching at home and you don't feel comfortable, if we have internet, if we have internet, we are going to live stream the business meeting. So you will be able to be in the know about everything that's going on and we're going to be updating on the playground and the land over here and everything. So we're going to be giving you updates on all kinds of cool stuff. We're going to be voting on a nominating committee. Uh, we'll be voting on a nominating committee as well as filling. Uh, we have John Farr is rotating off of the board of directors. John has done a phenomenal job, and we're very thankful for him and the work that he's put in. Um, but we will be voting as well to fill that spot on the board of directors. So um, you have to be present to vote. We will not be doing any internet voting for the business meeting tonight. So please be here, be present. We will have overflow in the foyer and over in the fellowship hall for anybody that, that wants to be here. But if we fill up, that's okay. So we're going to have that as an opportunity tonight. We're so excited. Now, here's my disclaimer for this morning. As we get into the message and the service this morning, I want to give you, well, hold on a second, one thing before the disclaimer. Last week, I completely forgot to mention worship through giving <laughs> in two services. Like, I didn't just miss it in one service, I missed it in both services. So I want to encourage you at any time during the worship service, we have our giving boxes in the back. You can worship through giving as an act of worship between you and the Lord. You can take your envelope or your check and drop it in, the, in, the, in one of those boxes and we'll get it. Um, if you are giving online, you can go to BethesdaClayton.com slash give, and you can worship through giving in that way as well. I'll probably mention this again at the end of the service to make up for not doing it last week. So now, disclaimer. Here's the disclaimer. Last week, Jesus was talking about murder and anger. This week, Jesus is talking about adultery and lust. So I want to give you a heads up as especially parents with younger kids, this is going to be a hard discussion. This is not going to be the warm fuzzies this morning. Um, so with that being said, we're going to look directly at what Jesus says, how it applies to our lives, how we should live differently because of that. We're going to stay true to the text, um, but it probably won't be the lighthearted, jovial joking around that I do in some of my other sermons. So I just want to give you a heads up, especially you watching online. I don't want you to be caught off guard by the subject matter. Okay, so this morning as we as we jump into a time of praise, I want to ask, I want to ask you who are listening, you who are here, and if somehow somebody's watching from home, whatever, I want to ask, please be in prayer for the delivery of the message this morning. This is not an easy text. It is not a fun text, um, but it is necessary for glorifying our God and King. So. Would you pray with me and pray for me this morning? Dear Jesus, we thank you so much for who you are and how you love us. Lord God, I pray that as we sing praises to you, would you prepare our hearts and our minds to hear and receive the word this morning, that we would be willing to act on that word, that we would be, God, we would be changed and shaped more into your image. Lord, I pray that you would help me to deliver the word faithfully, God, with with grace and courage and boldness as well as wisdom. And uh, Lord, I just pray that above all things that you would be glorified this morning. May we sing praise to your wonderful name for you are worthy of all of our praise and adoration. We love you, Jesus. We praise you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and uh, let's worship a God who is uh, faithful uh, to us through everything we do.
sung songs about becoming holy, being made holy, our hearts being pure. Um, and that's what we strive for. And that's as, as Jesus goes through in, in the Sermon on the Mount, he's really addressing the things of the heart. But we also get to love and worship a God who knows that despite our desire to be holy, desire to be pure of heart, we are going to fail. And despite our failures, he loves us anymore and has a love that, that surpasses our failures. And he demonstrates that for us on the cross. So let's continue to sing How Deep the Father's Love. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast is beyond all
So we thank you again so much for this opportunity for us to come and to hear from your word and to be changed more into your image. Lord, I pray for grace and mercy in the deliverance of this message this morning and that you would work in us to love you more and to be more appreciative of the grace and mercy that you've poured out for us. Lord, we love you, Jesus. We praise you and we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I'm going to give a minute for parents who are wanting to uh, take their kids out for this part of the message. We have a couple of parents who are going to, who are going to take their, their kids out. I um, want to give them an opportunity to do that real quick. Um, as we are, the subject matter this morning is going to be a little intense, and so we wanted to give them an opportunity to do that. Um, so, all righty, all righty. We're going to be back in Matthew chapter 5. Shocker. Back in Matthew chapter 5, so if you, if you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open up to Matthew 5. We're going to be looking at verses 27 through 30. Matthew 5, 27 through 30. Um, that's going to be where we're camping out this morning. Um, last week, we talked about the relationship between murder and anger. And we talked about how... Basically, you know, he said, you've heard it said, thou shalt not murder, but I tell you, do not be angry. Don't be angry with your brother or sister. He talks about reconciliation inside the body of Christ. There was a note that I missed in there, and I'm ashamed to say that I missed this. And so, and the reason that I thought about it this week is because it definitely applies to this week as well. And that is grace, right? And so... Last week, I focused really heavily on the idea of as the body of Christ, as the church, being the body of Christ, being the church, that we would extend grace and mercy to each other and be reconciled to each other if we are angry with our brother or sister, if we have an issue with one of our brothers or sisters, that we would be reconciled to each other in a means of grace. I want to say today that as we talk about this issue of adultery and lust, that today that there would be grace as well. So I, I fully believe that in this conversation today that there will be many, if not all of us, that fall under some form of conviction. And so doing, I also want to encourage you that there is grace. Grace. Again, hear that word. Grace. Okay? Here's why I say that. I want to give you some things to help you understand that, and some of you know that we live in a hypersexual culture, right? It is everywhere. It is all over social media. It is all over the news. It's in every commercial, TV show. Like, we literally have to, we have had to have industries created like Pure Flicks, right? Where they literally bleep out the bad words and they take out the sexual content and the, the uh, absurd amount of violence. We have networks like the Up Network. I don't know if you've ever seen the Up Network. The Bates are awesome. I love that show. Lucinda got me into it. The Up Network, where it's all about uplifting things. It's about, and it's supposed to be a, a Christian centered channel. And we have Christian channels and we have all that. And so, but on, on most other channels, Sex sells. Sex is everywhere. The, they get as close to the nudity line as they can get when they're, when they're showing you something on TV or in a movie. They get as close as they can without going over the line. In, and they keep pushing that line further and further and further. And the point is, is that we are inundated. It is on your cell phones. It is on your computers. It is on our, our TVs. It's, it's everywhere. And so there was a, and so here's, here's the ramifications, some of the ramifications of a hypersexual culture. I knew a gentleman who was a godly man, loved the Lord, loved the Lord, made a mistake, made a horrible mistake. And a few years back, there was a website, and they may still have this website, I don't know, it's called Ashley Madison. And this Ashley Madison website was literally about was literally for people who were looking to have an affair. If you were married, whether a man or a woman, you could go to this website and it would help you find somebody to have an affair with. And this hypersexual culture, this gentleman who, who loved the Lord, 
He knew that when the list came out, there was, a, there was a leak. Somebody had hacked into Ashley Madison, and they had a list of all their clients. And so this gentleman knew that when this list came out, he knew that his name would be on that list. And in, in, a, in a, an overwhelming sense of shame, not wanting to face the reality of his own sinful degradation, he took his own life. This man had been a pastor. This man had, had served in ministry for a long time. And he's not one of those, he, he's not somebody that you would look at and think, man, he's going to struggle with this. But, but surely he struggled, right? And he was so embarrassed at the consequences of his sin that instead of facing it, he took his own life. This week in Gwinnett County in Atlanta, 39 missing children were found. 39 children who were in the human sex trafficking ring. 39 children who had been taken from their homes, taken from their parents, who were considered missing, were found as a part of the human sex trafficking ring. About a month ago in Mission, Michigan, 57 of 71 missing children were found. 57 of 71. We think 57 is pretty good, but think about, like, you know I ain't good at math. Think about those other kids that weren't found. Here's my point, is that our sexual, our, our unhealthy, the unhealthy sexual drive that we have, the unhealthy sexual lust that we have, is, is not only, it's not only ruining lives in our local circles, it's not only decaying the fabric of our very souls and, and corroding our souls, but it's also impacting around the globe. The porn industry is ginormous. It is huge. Sex trafficking around the world is a huge industry, and it's driven by lust. So this morning, when I talk about adultery and lust, this is not a victimless crime. This is not a sin that is just between a husband and a wife. This is a sin that has absolutely, has absolutely crushed the church. How many times have we heard stories of pastors who've fallen into moral failure? How many times have we heard stories of of church leaders falling into moral failure? How many times have we heard stories of people inside the church falling into moral failure? And yet we as the church want to maintain this ability to speak to moral issues in our culture. But we've compromised our own souls in this area. So this morning, I want you to listen closely as we jump into this. You have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For your body, for, you, for it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. What a hard text to wrestle with, right? I mean, he's talking about gouging out eyes and cutting off hands. But first, let's deal with adultery. Let's deal with adultery. Adultery, as we define it, is someone who is married... Someone who is married having sexual relations with someone other than their partner. That's adultery. A married person having sex with someone that is not their spouse. So when we talk about the idea of adultery, we have to understand the idea of marriage, okay? And what marriage is and why it matters. The idea is, is that in marriage, marriage is itself a reflection of the gospel, if we go back and look at what Paul talks about in Ephesians where he says the husband is over the wife is the same way as Christ is over the church. 
The idea is, is that the husband and the wife in the relationship of marriage, Jesus is called the bridegroom and we are the bride as the church. There is a marital reflection in the gospel that we have been redeemed, that we as the church, as those called of God, have been redeemed to be united with Christ. So when we talk about marriage, marriage is a reflection of the gospel. The marital relationship is itself a reflection of the gospel. And think about this. When you get married, right? I don't know if you guys can, hopefully you can remember your wedding day when you got all spiffy and, you know, you got all, got your hair did. And, you know, I actually let Lucinda pluck my eyebrows. I'm not kidding you, man. These ones not so bad, but when she got out here, like that's a test of your manhood right there. I mean, I'm not afraid to say I cried a little bit, you know. Um, so plucked my eyebrows. I got all done up, took a shower, put on some cologne, you know. And I'm not afraid to say either that when I saw her coming down the aisle, like I'd love to tell you that I was crying. I didn't know what to do, right? I saw her come down the aisle. I was like, man, praise the Lord for he is good, you know? And I, I saw her coming down the aisle. I didn't know what to do. I wanted to cry. I wanted to shout for joy. I was so excited. She comes down the aisle and my, my, my groomsmen are, are behind me, my best friend growing up and some of my other, my other buddies that I grew up with. And behind her are some of her friends from college and friends that she grew up with. And, and so we're there with all of our friends and family there in front of us witnessing this exchanging of vows. They're witnessing a covenant. The, the establishing of a covenant. And so, so not only in, in marriage and in the wedding did Lucinda and I exchange our vows and create a covenant with each other, right? This covenant relationship that we would be together until death do us part, right? I think she's thought of some clever ways to get that here sooner than later. But until death do us part, we're, we're there, we're together, so in front of all of our friends and family, all of those witnesses, not only did we make a, not only do we have witnesses to our covenant to each other, we have witnesses to our covenant before God. That we made a covenant before, uh, between us and the Lord that he brought us together. Acknowledging God's sovereign hand in bringing us together as man and wife, that we would start a family and we have been so blessed that we would love each other, as, that I would love my wife as Christ loved the church. Let me, let me, let me tell you, let me, let me go ahead and say it again, that I would love my wife as Christ loved the church. And I would love to tell you that I was really good at that. But you don't realize how selfish you are until you get married, right? Um, when she says, I just want a few of your fries, you find out how holy you are. Um... And so in that, this sense of adultery is a breaking of a covenant. You are breaking a covenant for a momentary pleasure. Life is rough. You've got kids. You've got bills. You've got all this other stuff. And all of a sudden, you're not feeling as manly as you once were. And somebody starts flirting with you and making you feel like, oh, you're somebody now. In a moment, in, in a split second, stupid decision. In a moment of temporary pleasure, you, the promise of pleasure is really what it is. And let me say, not even the promise of pleasure, it's the illusion of pleasure. It's the illusion because in that moment, this person who makes you feel good about yourself, this person who makes you feel like you're attractive and wanted and all this other stuff, this person who's telling you all these things, what they're not telling you is, is that if you sleep with them, there will be destruction on the other side. That momentary pleasure is going to be met with ripped apart feelings, with ripped apart homes. With ripped apart lives and the fallout of that decision, the fallout of adultery is devastating. And I'm preaching to the choir. 
right? Because you see it. You've seen it. If, if not in your own life, you've seen it in other people's lives. You've seen it in family members, friends, the community. You've seen it on TV. We've seen it in, in television shows where it, it almost has become the norm for people to have affairs, get divorced, remarry over and over. This cycle, this cycle of broken covenants. See, when it's, when it's just us, it doesn't seem that bad, right? When it's just us, we can, we can say, well, you know, if she'd have been treating me better, if she would have taken care of me, then, then I wouldn't have done that. Yeah, we make all these excuses, but what we don't pay attention to is, one, is the broken covenant that we have now between not only us and our partner, but between us and the Lord. We've broken a covenant. This is no small thing. And then there's the other fallout, the fallout of our children. How many kids get caught in the crosshairs between moms and dads who have had a falling out over adultery or over an affair or over whatever it is? We see this, we see this constantly, this momentary pleasure with disastrous, disastrous consequences. Sin Always, sin always offers us the momentary pleasure, uh, the illusion of momentary pleasure. And it seems to somehow hide the obvious devastating consequences. Sin destroys. Sin is a disease. It's a disease that we all struggle with. It's a disease that we all struggle with. And so my sin struggle may be different than your sin struggle. But let me tell you, in this area of lust, it's pretty universal. It's pretty universal. And it's not just men. Men and women struggle with this idea of lust. And lust is what is, what is at the heart of is what's at the heart of adultery. He says, you have heard that it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you, everyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So it's not just the physical act of sex. It is it is goes beyond that. It's that it's that furtive look. It's the you Now let me say this. There's a difference between there's a difference between a glance and a man who looks lustfully at a woman. Who looks at a woman lustfully. I.e., here's the point. If I am walking down the road and I notice something, I notice somebody walking by, I'm fine. But if I do one of these, I'm not fine, right? If I notice that there's a woman walking towards me, that's fine. I've done nothing wrong. Even if I notice that she's attractive or she's pretty or whatever, I've done nothing wrong. It's when I look at her with a lustful intent, right? It's when I look at her and think of sexual gratification, that's when I have strayed into lust and into sin. It's okay to say, it, look, look, somebody put it to me like this one time when I was a kid. They say, look, you don't get dirty when a, just because a muddy dog runs into your yard. You only get dirty when you get down there and play with him. Right? So think about this. When that thought comes through your mind, when that thought comes through your mind, man, she's a looker. Or man, he's a looker or whatever. When that goes through your mind, you let it keep going. When you entertain that thought, when you focus on that thought, when you, when you continue to, when you marinate on that thought, when you marinate on that thought, you are giving in to lust. It's not the first look that gets you, it's the second. It's not the first look where you recognize, it's the second look where you're longing. The first look is just your eyes. The second look is your heart. Does that make sense? So when we look lustfully, it's not the physical act alone, it's the evil intent of our hearts. And we talked about this last week, how our thoughts and attitudes lead to our actions. Our thoughts and attitudes lead to our actions. And so the way that we, the way that we think about our spouse, the way that we value our spouse, can, can mentally put us in a framework where we're more susceptible to this sin. 
The way that we think about uh, men and women, the way that we think about other people can affect the way that we view this. Your thoughts and your attitudes will lead to your actions. So if, and here's my point with that is get a hold of this problem before it grows. Get a hold of this problem. If you know that your thought life is not where it's supposed to be, if you know that you have a wandering eye, if you know that you have lust in your heart, if you know that you are prone to click on certain websites, if you know that your phone goes where it should not go, if you know that these things are in you, it is not a problem with your thumb. Don't cut your thumb off. It is not a problem with your eye. Don't gouge your eye out. I'm going to get to that in a minute. The problem is in your heart. The problem starts here. It doesn't start here. Or for those of you who are not very tech savvy, here. Right? It doesn't start with your phone or your computer. It starts that your heart is not where it's supposed to be. That's the problem. And let me also say this too. It is idolatry. Hear me out now. It is idolatry. Because you are choosing, when you choose lustful thoughts, when you're choosing to click on that website, when you're choosing pornography over your spouse, when you're choosing to to even think lustfully about another person, when you're choosing to do this, you are choosing something other than what God designed for marriage. You're choosing something other than what God designed for you. And so in doing, You are saying, God, my way is better than your way. Now, you may not be consciously thinking that. Let's be honest. You're probably not really thinking much at all. You're in the moment. Your sin nature has taken over. You are are being driven by lust. So somewhere in there, we've got to put the brakes on. It is idolatry. So not only is it a breaking of a covenant between you and your spouse... It is idolatrous and it is a breaking of a covenant between you and the Lord. Now, this doesn't mean you're going to lose your salvation, okay? God's grace is bigger than your sin. Amen? Amen. So, what we're talking about here is that there is a heart issue. Now, let's get to that real quick. He's talking about gouging out eyes and cutting off hands. If your right eye causes you to sin, gouge it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Let me say this. Some people would say, well, is Jesus, is Jesus serious about cutting off hands and gouging out eyes? Yes. He is. But just so that we don't become, you know, Bethesda Stumpy Baptist Church, you know, um, the idea isn't, it's not, he says, if your hand or if your eye. But I just told you, this is not an issue of your hand or your eye. Your eye is what sees and perceives. Your heart is what leads you astray. Your hand is what acts, but your hand is acting in accordance with your heart. So it is both the the eyes and the hand are just a product of the heart. Now, please don't go cut your heart out either. That's not good. But as John Owens, one one of the great theologians of the past, John Owens said, Be killing sin or it will be killing you. I love that quote. There is no either or. There is no, you know, there, there is no neutral, right? There is no neutral. And if you think you're coasting on neutral, you are, you need to take, take note of where you are spiritually because you're probably really close to a fall. You're probably really close to screwing up, right? Because if you think you're coasting on neutral, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. It's like, have you ever, my yard, I don't know, this is just a COVID thing, I guess. Like, we've never really cared about our grass before, right? Never really cared about our grass. But we have Bermuda, right? We have this fancy, plush Bermuda. And really all it was at first was just dirt spots with a few green patches of grass in there. But as we've, our neighbor across the street started, started doing stuff with grass. And so he started fertilizing. And I'm telling you, man, I love my neighbor. He is awesome. Um, this cat... 
I mean, he cuts his grass, weed eats his grass. Like, he is all about that grass. He has the nicest lawn of anybody in our neighborhood, I'm pretty sure. Um, and it's, it's awesome. More power to him, man. I, I'm lucky that I cut my grass and I just got a weed eater, right? But with the fertilizer and everything else, I think I'm just feeding the weeds. But have you ever had crabgrass? Anybody ever had crabgrass? It starts off and it's just like, well, it makes my yard look more green. I'm not going to worry about it. Next thing you know, if you are not actively trying to kill crabgrass, it will be all over your yard before you know it. It starts out just next to the sidewalk. It starts out just next to the street. Next thing you know, you wake up the next morning and it's all over your yard. It's in the middle of your yard. It's all over the place. Now that nice, beautiful Bermuda grass can't even be seen because it looks like your yard is completely made up of weeds. Hear me, brothers and sisters. If you don't tend to your soul, all that will be left is sin. If you don't, if you don't tend to your soul, if you don't take care of your soul, if you, don't, if you don't deal with these issues when it's just at the edges, when it's just at the perimeter of your heart, when, when, when sin is, is tempting you and, and pulling you towards, towards lust or towards whatever that sin is, if, if you don't tend to that when it's just on the boundaries, you will wake up and think, what happened? And it has absolutely permeated your life. And that which was a minor a nuisance is now running your life. And now your life is going to be characterized and defined by the consequences of the sin. That momentary pleasure gave way, that momentary pleasure gave way to a life-changing consequence. How many times have we heard the stories of families ripped apart by a decision made in a moment? I'm not telling you to cut off your hand or gouge out your eye. I am telling you to do battle with your soul. I am encouraging you above all else to purge your heart. Sin is real and it wants to destroy you. Don't give it a chance. Your evil heart is what's causing you to stumble. Now, there's a couple of different theories. And one of these, is I'm, I'm more personal. I think my personality draws me to this solution. One solution that I see so many people doing is they try to guard themselves against sin so much. They're playing a defensive game. I don't know if, have any of y'all ever watched? Like, let me, let me think about football. Have you ever seen a team that just had, they had a horrible offense, but they had a great defense? They don't win Super Bowls, right? It's the teams that have a spectacular offense and a pretty good defense, right? It's the idea. So, so here's my point is, don't live your life completely always saturated in the defense, on the defense, trying to guard yourself all the time. Let me give you another scenario. And it's a both and, it's not an either or. Here's the other scenario, is that we pursue Jesus with everything that we have. We love God with everything that we have. We study the scriptures, we pray, we interact with other believers, we serve other people, we share the good news, we live out the gospel. We're aware, we take account of our hearts, we have that defensive game, but we don't wait in defense. We live on offense. We live our lives for the sake of the gospel. We live to go out and share the good news with people. We live to the glory of God every single day. We take captive those thoughts that threaten our families and threaten our relationships. We take captive those thoughts that would imprison us in the consequences of a momentary pleasure. We take captive those thoughts and we live intentionally to preserve our families. We live intentionally to love our wives and kids. We live intentionally to show God's glory in how we live, praying that by God's grace, that by God's grace we would not stumble into that which would dishonor His name and rip apart our families. We pray that by God's grace we would represent Him well as followers of Jesus Christ. 
We're all human. We're all human. And I'm not so foolish as to think that there's no one in this room that's struggling with this. And I'm not so foolish as to think that sin, which causes so much shame and guilt and the baggage that comes with it, and the shame that we feel because of that sin that weighs us down and makes us feel unworthy and makes us feel anxious and makes us feel overwhelmed. So we hide it and we bury it down deep. Let me assure you, brothers and sisters, it will come home to roost. It's not a matter of just burying it down deep. The Bible also tells us that if we, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us. So I want to encourage you this morning as we do this that God's grace is so much bigger than our sin. No matter how big, how much baggage you feel heaped on top of you, even hearing me talk about this subject can cause shivers in your heart. Let me encourage you that if that's you this morning and you've got that baggage and you've got that sin on your back and you feel the weight of it, and, but you can't talk to anybody about it and you don't feel like you can talk about it and you, you just feel like this is your burden to bury or to carry, let me encourage you not to carry that burden. Let me encourage you to come and lay that burden down. You can always talk to Jesus about it. You can talk to me about it. I'm not going to slay you for it. There is grace. There is grace. Don't live in hiding. Live in the freedom that we talked about in the book of Galatians. Live in the freedom that comes from knowing Christ. If you've done wrong, you've done wrong. Admit it. Confess it. Be forgiven and move on. If you've never given your heart and life to Jesus Christ, lust is not the only sin that you are plagued by. We have a whole barrage of sins that plague the soul and plague the heart. And if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I encourage you to come and be forgiven once and for all. If you are a believer, if you are a follower of Christ, struggling with lust does not cancel out your salvation because there's nothing that you or I can do that can cancel out the work of Christ that He did on the cross. Our salvation is not dependent upon what we do. Our salvation is dependent upon what He did on the cross. So grace, abundant grace. But let's be faithful in confronting our sin, confessing our sin, and receiving that grace. So this morning as the band comes up to get ready to lead us in a song of reflection, if you need to talk, I'll be down here. I'll put this thing on. Um, I'll be down here if you want to talk. If you want to come and just do business with God, there's no judgment. This is between you and the Lord. But don't don't leave here with that same baggage on your heart and on your soul. Let's let's shuck that baggage. Let's shed those things so that we can go out and be fully devoted followers of Christ who hunger and thirst to share God's love and grace and mercy with other people. And if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you're not sure that you're saved, come and talk with me this morning. I'd love to introduce you to him and tell you how to start a life in Christ and know that you can have forgiveness for all of eternity and you will be saved. Do business with the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. Lord God, I pray for my brothers and sisters in Christ that, Lord, that if there are those in this room that struggle or have struggled, Lord, give them the courage and the boldness to, to, to do business with you. Lord, help them not to just sweep it under the rug or push it down or bottle it up, Lord, but that they would get that off of them. Lord, that they would trust you with it, that they would give that to you, that you would, God, that you would be glorified in their lives, that this stain would be removed. Lord God, I pray for those in this room that may not know you at all, that may have never given their lives to you. Maybe they gave you lip service, but they haven't given you their hearts. Lord, I pray that you would call them to salvation. Holy Spirit, that you would grab a hold of them and call them to a brand new day in you, that they would be saved forever. Lord God, I pray that your grace would be on full display this morning, that your grace, your forgiveness, your love for us would be displayed in this moment. Lord, we love you and we praise you and we pray these things in your name. Amen.
Amen. Would you stand and do business with the Lord as he leads you? We bow our hearts. We bend our knees. Oh, Spirit, come make us humble. draw this to a close, I want to encourage you with a couple things. One, um, I do want to encourage you again to worship through giving. If you have not uh, worshiped through giving, it is not a sense of obligation to us. It's not a sense of obligation to anybody. It is out of a desire of thankfulness and thanksgiving to the Lord that we give back to the church to expand His kingdom, to expand His work in this area. So I want to encourage you to worship God through your giving. We have boxes in the back that you can drop your offering envelopes in and worship through giving on the way out. Or if you want to do it online or on your phone, go to BethesdaClayton.com slash give and you can do it right there from home. You can do it on your computer or your phone. Um, also, I want to encourage you this week, continue to marinate, not just in the area of lust, but in the mortifi- mortification of the heart. Like, I want you to think about constantly purifying ourselves, purifying ourselves. What is it that you struggle with? Maybe it's not lust. Maybe it's gossip, which is venom. Maybe it's, who knows, whatever it is, jealousy or envy or whatever. I want to encourage you to do business with the Lord. Dig into the Word this week. Let's be the believers that we've always wanted to be, right? So thank you guys. I love you. Let me pray and we'll be dismissed. Dear Jesus, uh, we thank you so much. We love you. We praise you. Lord God, I pray that as we go out that we would be missionaries, God, that we take your message. We take your message of love and reconciliation to all those who have never heard. Lord, I pray that you would be glorified in us this week or that you would do business with us constantly. Not, God, I pray that we would... We would long and hunger to sit at your feet. God, that we would long and hunger to be refined by you, but also to be loved by you. Lord, we love you and we praise you. And we pray these things in your name. Amen. Amen. I also want to encourage you guys as well. Come back tonight for the business meeting at 630. It should be an exciting time. Love you guys. Have a great week.